you all for having me. Um, can we just get a quick check that you can all see my slides? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so yeah, um, thank you for having me. I was I was invited today to to share a little bit of my career journey, which, as you can probably hear from the title, has has been far from traditional. So I'll give an overview of um, where my career has taken me so far, and, and and a little bit of insight into my current role um, at Automatic, and then I'll leave the rest of the space for for any questions. So, um, yeah. My name is um, Anna. Um, I'm head of engineering development at Automatic. Um, this is a role that sits at the intersection of, of people and tech technology. So we oversee um, support and infrastructure around developer tooling, developer productivity, um, and also growth and uh, happiness promotion within the organization. So it cuts across uh, a huge gamut of um, things and, and is um, super interesting and varied. And, and I'll speak a little bit more to that later in the presentation, because first we have to get to how I got from this to this. So um, yeah, as, as the title of my presentation um, uh, alludes, I, I didn't start out working in the tech space at all. Um, and so have taken a, a very kind of um, circuitous route to get to um, the role that I'm in now. Um, and my initial um, kind of university education was in, in humanities, did a history PhD, but then ultimately I went the way that most um, history graduates um, go. <laughs> I, I went to the law um, and started working in, in cr criminal defence, um, working primarily on, um, uh, I just got a message to say my internet connection is unstable, so hopefully it holds out. Um, working primarily on kind of high profile crime, um, criminal um, crown court cases. So um, yeah, not your, not your low level petty, but, uh, petty crime. Um, and this is happening, I guess, against the context of a lot of changes in, in the legal aid space. So just to contextualize some of the career changes, um, thinking that was happening, um, the, the workload was increasing, legal aid funding was being um, decreased, and so all of that promoted uh, longer hours and, and just a sort of culture of um, overwork that to me at that point in time, very early in my career, felt um, unsustainable. And so already, kind of two years into my legal career, um, I was looking to see, you know, what, what else was out there, what, what um, changes I could make to make my career more sustainable for me. And initially that was looking at things like cross-qualifying into different areas of law, retraining as a barrister, um, but the ultimate transition took me away from law completely. Um, and I got there really by just leaning into my interests. So I started learning how to code. I think by accident, I happened to, uh, across like one of those um, kind of like gamified coding platforms, I think Code Wars or something similar, and it piqued my interest. And um, then I came across an organization called Code First Girls, who are pretty established um, here in Manchester and, and elsewhere nationally, and ended up taking one of their courses, which are aimed um, at undergraduates and recent graduates. Um, and the idea is to just promote coding edu education and to um, challenge the idea that there isn't a place for women in technology roles. Um, and so I was doing this course alongside uh, incredibly overwhelmed in my, in my legal um, job and really loving the challenge of learning to code, loving doing something that was completely different from my day job. But what was really interesting about this opportunity was really it was the first time that I had been um, introduced to the idea that there was a space for someone like me in, in a technology role, um, someone who hadn't done a computer science degree, somebody who wasn't really technically aligned in the work that I was doing. Um, and I met people who really challenged the perception that I held. Um, and I just couldn't really let go of the idea that perhaps this was something that I would want to lean into and explore. And ultimately ended up um, going the route that's quite traditional now, um, but wasn't really very common back then, I did a intensive coding boot camp. Um, I uh, got a scholarship to attend and in, did a 16 week intensive coding boot camp. And about two weeks out from the coding boot camp, I went into my first job uh, as a software engineer. Um, 
at the BBC. So I was working as a, a back-end software engineer on, on the uh, platform team, which is um, building internal APIs for software engineers internally to use. So um, they can consume um, data and content from within the BBC and use it to populate their products. Um, but the, the context here was that I was the first hire that the BBC Manchester had made um, from a boot camp. Um, I was also um, joining a team where everyone else had um, not just a degree in computer science, but a PhD in computer science. So, of course, the, the imposter syndrome, which I think we all experience from time to time at this point, was um, a little bit debilitating. And so I was thinking about ways that I could really sort of validate myself, but also promote my growth. And the way in which I decided to do this was to use the skills that I did have to teach others and to um, promote something that I believe really strongly in, which is the democratization of coding education. And the first way that I did that was to go back to Code First Girls, so the organization that first taught me how to code. I went back to them as a volunteer instructor and started um, contributing to the community here in Manchester and teaching some of their introduction to coding courses. Um, but then I also saw that teaching coding and the democratization that happens as a result of promoting coding education can be extended to have an even greater impact. And so I became involved with a number of different organizations that were leaning into that space. The first of which um, is Code Your Future, which was an organization that was established in London at the time, hadn't yet established itself in Manchester, that was concerned with promoting and providing a free coding education to refugees and asylum seekers. Um, so I came on as a volunteer and helped establish the very first cohort here in Manchester. Um, and then the other organization, just to bring it full circle, um, was an organization called Code 4000, um, which actually teaches coding um, and specifically front end development to um, inmates in prisons throughout the UK. And it has the additional challenge of having to do this offline because they don't have internet access. Um, and so all of this stuff, all of these volunteer opportunities were things that I was doing really for my own self-interest because I enjoy teaching people. I enjoy the validation that comes from being able to pass on skills that I've acquired. Um, but it also became quite visible and actually led to my next opportunity in um, the tech space, which was um, with the Hut Group, which is an uh, e-commerce unicorn based out of Manchester now, um, who were concerned primarily with um, wanting to build out a sustainable pipeline of talent. So the way in which they decided that they wanted to do this was to take people who didn't come from a computer science background and to hire them and then train them up internally. So building out the pipeline internally, which again is a model that we're starting to see more of now, but, but um, a couple of years ago when we were trying to do this was, um, was pretty new. Um, and so that challenge was incredibly attractive for me. It combined a lot of my interests. I still got to code. I, I, I got to teach other people how to code. And more importantly, I got to, um, kind of promote a more inclusive tech workforce by making sure that we can extend opportunities to to those that may not traditionally um, find their way into into a talent pool and so once this was up and running and successful and, it, and it's still running to this day um, my kind of naturally inquisitive nature started looking for the next challenge um, and again leaning into the things that really interest me um, I found my way to Automatic and the role that I actually joined Automatic to do was that of an internal developer advocate. So developer advocacy is a discipline that you hear a lot of, but it's usually um, externally facing. So promoting um, the use of products to other developers or providing or creating content that can be consumed by developers externally. This role was the first that I'd seen where it was internally focused, where the entire focus of the role was to advocate for engineers within the organization itself. So promoting opportunities for them to 
to grow, to, to learn, to, to onboard more efficiently, to be promoted into leadership positions. Um, all of that sort of thing that um, is really, really important to the health of an engineering organization, but it's but is often overlooked. Um, so yeah, I find myself at Automatic. And, and Automatic, for those of you who aren't familiar, is probably best known um, for some of our products. Um, we're the people behind WordPress.com. Uh, we are also the people behind Tumblr and WooCommerce and, and hundreds of other products that uh, you may have used, but you may not be familiar with, with us and our brand. Um, and we're a completely distributed organization. So before COVID forced us all to be remote, um, we were already working that way and have been since about 2007. Um, so we're also known within kind of the tech world as some of the pioneers in, for remote work. And, and that shapes how we work as an organization. Just to give some context to uh, how, how we're operating. Um, I just checked our stats before we came on today and we're now at 1,511 people across 82 different countries and speaking 102 different languages. So we're definitely doing distributed work at scale and we're definitely facing some challenges in terms of how we work that um, people that are working remotely but within the same time zone aren't necessarily facing. Um, and so that's some of the problems that, that we try and solve within the engineering development team. One of the biggest challenges, and this is where I found myself kind of in a whole new world of, of, of data, um, was that when we arrived, uh, when I arrived at the company, a lot of our data was siloed. So we're a completely distributed company, but we're, we've fallen into the trap of siloing some of our um, really important and business critical data. Um, and this is at odds to the culture of automatic as well, because one of the things that we have that is core to how we work um, is that our DNA is basically rooted in the open source community. So we default to open and we default to um, transparency and giving people to access to almost everything from the minute that they join the company. But one place that we weren't seeing this happening was in how we were um, using, sharing and, and promoting our data. And so a lot of the problems that I was brought in to try and solve were obscured by the fact that the data either wasn't there because we hadn't um, we hadn't started tracking for it, we hadn't defined the metrics, we hadn't set up the infrastructure to be able to access the data that was needed, or it was siloed away somewhere in 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 um, yeah in in, in a, a repository where I didn't have access to it. And so all of this led to alongside all of the additional work that I was doing, a, a gradual process of changing the culture of data within specifically the, the people operations, talent operations side of the business. So we had a lot of data that we were sharing internally around the products, about our users, but the data that indicated how well we were doing as an organization, um, how efficient our teams were, how happy our employees were, were, were was at that point completely obscured. And so, this has been like a, a huge um, focus of mine since joining the company is democratizing the data so giving people access to the data at the point at which they need it or even at the point of which they're interested so they don't need to be accessing that data to be able to make a business decision um, but also just being transparent about the state of the company and using the data to tell that story but it's not just about access and and, and in many sense, if it were just about access, then we don't have much of a problem within Automatic because our default to transparency has positioned us to be able to make this transition quite easily. Once you've given people access, you also need to give them the tools, the comfort and the culture to be able to do with that data um, what's needed. So it's about empowering people across the organization to make data informed decisions and feeling confident that they have the tools to make good decisions because not all data informed decisions are good decisions. Um, and so this has been an ongoing project of mine. And certainly when I set out all those years ago to come into um, a software engineering career and then developer education, developer advocacy, this isn't necessarily the route that I thought I would end up going. But I guess the point that I'm trying to make is that in every 
um, role that I've had, I've just lent into the things that really interest me, really intrigue me, and that I feel passionately about. And through doing that, have been able to influence considerable change in the cultures that I'm working within, but also always find myself and find my way to the next great opportunity. And I think, as you can see, it's a really non-linear career trajectory. And I think we can feel pressure always to just take the next step on the ladder. But the, the next step for you might be a role that didn't even exist a year ago, or a week ago, or a month ago. Um, and that's certainly been my experience. So in every organization that I've been at since the BBC, I've been the first person doing a particular role. And then been in a position to really kind of influence the culture, the engineering culture, the culture around data, practices, processes. And so, yeah, that's kind of my brief um, history of my, my career. I've, I've reached a capacity where I'm now uncomfortable talking about myself. So I think that means that it's um, time for me to hand over to, to any questions. Um, and I can, I can definitely touch on uh, anything around my career, but also anything around the data culture at uh, Automatic as well.